Scott, and this is a 100-year-old Washburn guitar. It's, uh, it sounds good, it's playing good. It could use a little bit better intonation and um, string action. So we'll probably end up doing a neck reset, but what we're definitely going to do is uh, relocate this bridge. It was made with uh, Brazilian rosewood, sides and back, and a spruce top. The wood on the neck, it sure looks like mahogany. And uh, the fingerboard is also made of rosewood. So this, is a, this model is called a 1915-1915, if you're interested in finding you one. It'll probably need a couple adjustments, minor adjustments, if not major adjustments, uh, because of the way these were designed and uh, kept up over the years. So nothing too nefarious was done in the process of uh, this one being maintained. Uh, this is probably not the original bridge, but we'll get zooming in closer and uh, take a look at the different repairs that need to be done. Let's give it a listen to... Uh, reset, bridge locate, and in the process we'll end up fixing the bridge plate which is inside of the guitar that looks like it needs some help. We'll probably be taking a look at this contraption uh, before we're done with this video because this is my neck reset jig situation here. It, it clamps the guitars in from all angles. It allows me to check the uh, relief in the neck with the strings on it, which is nice, and it also let, lets me check the string alignment, which is a major problem in this guitar here. They used ebony wood back then on these these nuts. I don't know if this one's original or not, but they, the slots look kind of sloppy, but the strings aren't budging. So I guess it might be okay. We're going to leave that one alone. The frets, they could probably use a little dressing. The string alignment is a little too close on the base side and you can even see that there's more space to the left on the sound hole. The treble strings are shifted towards center a little further than the bass strings. This is the Saddlematic. It's a device that you place over the 12th fret and you um, take it right up to the nut. You flip it all the way around and bring it down here to the bridge and it, these little pinprick things show you exactly where the leading edge of the saddle should be, which would be behind where it is right now. So it needs to come back a full 3 30 seconds of an inch, which is just under an um, eighth of an inch, two and a half millimeters off, which is causing the, um, the, the bases to fret about 20 cents sharp at the 12th fret. I placed a mirror down on the bottom of the guitar. We're looking through the sound hole at the uh, ball ends of the strings. And you can see how the previous owner has double balled each string so they don't pull up through the bridge plate as badly and we'll try to get that fixed up while we're at it. We're gonna fill all those holes. Another way to look at it is to look at the center seam and it lines up closer with the G string bridge pin. It's much further away from the D. I think once we get it right in between will be in much better shape. The string action isn't end of the world high on this 12 fret guitar. I mean it's, these are tens by the way, and it's about seven and a half sixty-fourths on this side and six sixty-fourths over here. He'd like to get it down to about four sixty-fourths and uh, probably about six sixty-fourths over here. And maybe we can get a little taller saddle while we're at it. And maybe we can even put 11s on it. 
if the neck relief will allow us to, but he's okay with tens. These are some very strong magnets and they're not sticking to the neck at all. So this is just all wood in here. Probably want to leave tens on this guitar. That old patch is interesting. It was done with actual Brazilian. And the joint is a little sloppy, but they match the wood grain okay. I mean, some cracks along the side here seem to have been repaired a long time ago. Not too worried about that stuff for now. I'll double check everything to make sure it doesn't need any glue. Yeah, get you some of these old Brazilian wood guitars before they all run out. This one's got a serial number on it. It's nice they left the original tags from all these years. Here you can see what I mean by double balling. I sent a picture to the owner and he said, no more double balling. I'll heat the bridge before removing it. Doesn't she look pretty? So it's ready to to re-drill. I haven't even sanded it yet. It's it's nice and flat right there. It looks a, ugly as hell, but okay. So the saddlematic, what you do is you you put it here at the full fret, bring it up to the nut, lock it in, flip it around. That shows you where it's supposed to be. So we're gonna move it right to where it's supposed to be. And we're going to shift it um, one, one and a half millimeters towards the treble side. Right like there. Okay, so I came back two and a half millimeters and I went over one and a half millimeters. This one's not coming back much. I mean, maybe an eyelash, but we'll also move it over one and a half millimeters. Now I can eyeball it, I can put it here and eyeball it first. Well, that looks too far. That must not be two and a half millimeters. I have to color all this in with dirt and gook. This is the one spot that got cleaned off. Believe it or not, that's the one clean spot. But this being way too light, we'll put some finish on this. But we'll do that afterwards. With the two new holes drilled, I put the bridge in place. And I scored a little line around the back edge where the new line will be. And there's really not a lot of finish on here. It's mostly just dirt. Maybe a little shellac. You know, very light little scratch and it'll all be gone. And there's not much to remove on the treble side because that was already pretty much in the right place. So that's about it.
Here it is. No ball and double ball and needed anymore. You can see the windings of the strings are way down in there. And there's a touch up needed in front. The strings are aligned in the sound hole where they used to be way out. And now I've put two maple purfling shims underneath the saddle to simulate the saddle height that I will want, the desirable height. A nice brake angle. And it's given me some pretty high action here. So with the tuner, it's still quite a bit sharp at the 12th fret. Here we go. Had to get my little spring, string spreader out. There. So probably not going to win an award for the most beautiful inside of a guitar, but it's functional. It works great, and it sounds good. Now I'm measuring the distance from the neck to body joint, the 12th fret, to the leading edge of the saddle which is 12 inches. I'll also take the string action at the 12th fret, which is kind of high. Anyways, I'm determining how much I'd like to lower the saddle for the perfect 12th fret string action, which is about eighth of an inch. I want to lower the saddle eighth of an inch. Then I'll measure from the heel cap to the where the fretboard meets the neck, and I've got three inches there. So I wrote it all down here. I shimmed the saddle, came up with the height that I wanted. Then I took the action at the 12th fret, which is the neck to body joint. It was 9 64 I want to lower that. I want to get it down to 5 64 so I want to lower it by 4 64 or eighth of an inch, or three millimeters pretty much. So I measure the, that amount. I measure the heel, heel and the distance from the neck to body joint, basically the middle of the 12th fret to the front edge of the saddle, which is 311 millimeters, or 12 inches, 12.24, almost 12 and a quarter. So anyways, multiply 3 millimeters by 80, divided by 311, and we come up with 0.82, 8 tenths of a millimeter, which is 1 32nd of an inch, 31 thousandths of an inch. That's how much we're going to shave off the bottom of the heel to change our neck angle. First, we got to get the neck off. The other thing is, I'd like to say, is that the uh, 0.8 millimeters, 8 tenths of a millimeter, I'd say 9 out of 10 of the neck resets that I do fall into that exact same amount to trim from the heel. It's very common, and uh, that's, I just want to point that out. So as, as far as coloring this up, a lot of this is dirt, actually. This one spot cleared off when I was uh, cleaning up the glue squeeze or something, this spot cleared off. This is the color I want to shoot for, for coloring in this raw wood area. I'm going to go for this orange, not this light brown. And then we can kind of grime it up afterwards, maybe, to, to uh, kind of all blend together. So I've got a little shellac here. And I've got this one color that I mixed. It's, I call it dirty amber. I'm going to drop in two drops of that, and then just a prick, a pin prick of red. And this red is, uh, those first one is a, is a, is a dye, and this one is a pigment. So this is going to make it slightly opaque, less see-through. Now, this camera that I use has 30 times digital zoom, so a lot of times it can see things that the naked eye can't see. I have magnification on my, uh, over my glasses to help me see, basically, but um, a lot of times when I see my videos on the big screen after it's already uploaded to YouTube, I'm like, holy cow, I, I couldn't see that. <laughs> while I was filming it. Anyways, it's funny. You guys are probably able to critique this stuff way better than I can. 
as I'm doing it, you know, just, just so you know. This is a pretty good color. Dirty Amber. I, I talked about that a couple, I don't know, a couple months ago. I mixed that up. It was a vintage amber with, uh, I think, medium brown or golden brown. And I did like a 10 to 1 ratio, but after that video I decided 10 to 1 was, it wasn't brown enough for me, so I went to uh, more like a, oh, I don't know, maybe a 7 to 1 ratio or something like that. This shellac is, is super thin. This is the Zinsser Spray Shellac. I can go over it a couple times. It won't build up any thickness or anything. But there is a divot right here. I'm probably going to want to fill that in. So this is after just a few minutes of horsing around with that color. I think that it's really good. When you get when we zoom in closer, we can see it. Shellac is still wet looking. But I think what I can do is uh, come back and look at it again tomorrow. Put a little bit of clear finish over top of that color and uh, just hit it with some abrasive, you know, like some synthetic steel wool or something to dull it down. That's a wide fretboard. Wow. My heat deflector barely fits over this fretboard, it's so wide. Gonna warm this up with a 250 watt heat lamp bulb. It's hard to tell sometimes, but um, there it is. There's a neck pocket right there. It's a dovetail pocket. Now I'm going to drill a few more holes closer to the edge of the pocket. And there it is. Success. We'll insert the hot wire foam factory cutters. 12 minutes. After 12 minutes, I flip the guitar upside down and inject. I'm injecting piping hot water with a syringe hoping that it seeps down into the male portion of the dovetail seems to have worked wonders. Hold the guitar upside down that way. Then I put it back upside right. Then I flip it horizontal and start to give her some wiggles. I could tell she's coming loose. Get out the neck removal jig. Give it a little help. Help! Help! <laughs> oh! Came out nice. She's hot and steaming. Oh 
my. Take some paper towels and some of that real hot water that I have going. And just let it soak up that that water. Maybe 10 or 20 minutes it'll be soft. All that glue will just scrape right off. Same thing over here. I'll wedge this paper towel here. Been about an hour and a half, maybe hour and 45. Let's see if I can get this stuff off of here. Yeah, yeah, cause see it comes right off. Much easier this way. I'll get a little hot water on here to clean it right up. It's like a shovel. This little shovel works especially well on the inside portion of the, or the female portion. Of the dovetail gets right into the corner and then this gets right onto the back there it's like the perfect shape now I'll start marking my eight tenths of a millimeter to remove from the heel I'll just make a small mark right down here at the heel cap, both sides, meaning the base side and the treble side. Mark that 80 thousandths of an inch, or uh, 8 tenths of a millimeter. I think it's about 35 thousandths. Then I'll go across the back of the heel cap. It's a very soft wood, whatever this material is on the heel cap. I'm going to work my way down to this mark. That'll change our neck angle. Now I'll start undercutting the wood on the heel of the neck. There's a whole bunch of excess material in the center here. I want to leave about an eighth inch perimeter around the entire heel that I can shape in a uniform way. This old mahogany uh, carves real nice with a sharp chisel. I'll need to use a micro chisel right there once I get to the dovetail itself. That'll get me in between the dovetail and the perimeter mark. This neck already had an undercut look to it. It's nicely scooped out all along here. And I've taken this piece of Lexan and beveled it so that it fits right in there along the dovetail. 
80 grit sandpaper. Also speed things up, I come in and do a little chiseling. Oh, very soft stuff. Oh, because that's the cap. The heel cap is some kind of soft wood. Well, I got about halfway there in my first sanding and chiseling. I need to chisel off a little bit more. And lastly, after I get to my mark, I'll do a few sandpaper pulls with the neck on the body just to marry the heel to the body so that they have a nice fit with no gap. A lot of people do the entire neck angle change with their sandpaper pulls, but I find this uh, is uh, very uncomfortable for me. So I prefer to use this method and save the sandpaper pulls to a very minimum at the very last bit. After a few sandpaper pulls I'm ready to put the neck in. This is the uh, proper guitar workstation with expansion package. This is the expansion package. These are custom made and the back support come with the workstation. These supports are just 2x4s with magnets and a little cork on the top and they're uh, angled like wedges so that they fit to the arch of the back. The guitar back has a little arch to it so we'll put the neck in and, cl and clamp, put a clamp on it. Right. One clamp holds it. This is a thermoplastic call that fits these, I don't know what you call French dovetails. French heels, maybe? I don't know if they're French. I don't know if they're French or what, man. But, you know, once the string tension comes on, it could want to lift the neck up at the heel, the, at the bottom of the heel. So this will force it to stay right against the body. Okay, it's not supported here or here. It's fully supported by the dovetail and the clamps. And it's strung up. And the relief is at 5 64ths here and 4 64ths here. The string alignment is a little weird. I need to work this side of it because the treble strings are closer than the bass strings, closer to the edge. So we want the neck to come this way a little. So I need to take material off here. You ever seen a white ass shim? This is a white ass shim. Just on the base side because I had to correct the string alignment a little bit and uh, that's where it really seemed to pull need pulled in a little closer. So let's see if that I've been using these charcoal pencils lately. I I mark the inside the female side of the neck block, and then when my white shim goes into there it leaves marks. It pretty much looks like the whole length of it needs sanded a little bit, so I'm just going to go, 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 like that, and give it another try. It's always good to wipe it with a little bit of acetone. The rosewood is 
oily and it repels glue until you de-oil it. Then it should suck the glue right in. First, I'll glue this one. I didn't heat anything up, you know, I just figured out just slap it together real quick. I don't need to I don't need a lot of working time cuz I've got my clamps ready and everything. area. This glue's a little thick because I've had it I've had it uh, heating all day for some other job and uh, I should add a little water to it make it a little thinner. Anyways this will work. This will work. We'll make it easy for the next guy to take it off. We won't go crazy with clamps. Just hand tight with these quick grips. Probably got a little squeeze out. Not much. It's a nice fit. Alright, well that's it. Got all that trimming and gluing done all in one day. Next, I have to widen this from this real wimpy size to this hefty, hefty size for the K&K &K installation. First thing I do is I, I go into the hole with this bent coat hanger and I just make sure that the end block is uh, the adequate thickness for the jack. And then I start tapering it gradually from the most tapered to the least tapered I work my way up this one in the these in the hand drill this one I just use in the in a ratchet and I do this one in between each size till I work my way up to this finally to this non tapered one this is just under half an inch this is the uh, 31 64th size that's where I end and it's you know this one that I got from Stumac I know when I reach half inch when I hit this non tapered part right here and I actually go in like eighth of an inch which I think is fine and then I do the rest with this because I don't want this to tear out the very um, outside edge that's why I, I just use this up to get inside and then this fits inside and goes does the rest one last look Again, I can't remember if this is my first 12 fret guitar neck reset or what but it was different we got a newer taller saddle it's uh, the action string action at the 12th fret is a 5 64th and 4 64th and these are the 10 through 46 I think um, jazz strings with a wound G and uh, we got the K&K &K pickup installed look around here and you can see that I guess I'll plug it in and we'll give it a listen.
thanks again. I always appreciate you tuning in. If you learned anything today or want to say thanks, go to my channel, check the links, go to the store and grab some merchandise. We got the Harpeth guitar logo on t-shirts, coffee mugs, hoodies, whatever. So, catch you later. <laughs>